It's my huge pleasure to welcome um, Professor Stefan Derkon um, to um, SICE and to talk about his new book, Gambling on Development. I remember meeting him two years ago, but we've just discovered that we met twice before. We met a decade ago when I presented Working with the Grain at DFID, and we met two decades ago when Meles Zenawi, the president of Ethiopia, had a two-day workshop in the UK with a bunch of academics, um, and Professor Derkon was one of the eminent people there. Professor Derkon has spent decades doing research in Africa with a particular focus on Ethiopia. He um, was the chief economist that differed from 2011 to 2017, and today he is the professor of economic policy and the director of the Center for the Study of African Econ Econ Economies at the Blavatnik School at Oxford University. But this week in particular, in which those of you who've tuned into CNN know there's only one story which is being covered, which is the length of the queue. This week, this week in particular, I think that the credential that you have, Stefan, which is perhaps the most timely and the most powerful, was your 2018 award from Queen Elizabeth when she made you the Honorary Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. And so, Stefan, um, I look forward, and I, honored as I am to meet the Honorary Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, I hugely look forward to the presentation of your book. So. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Um, I've... I've never sold anything in my life. So I wrote a book and I thought I should sell it once in a while. And I seem to have for my travels from the UK, I had some copies for some reason they were hanging around. I'm happy to sell them, $30 each at the end of it, and you get a signature. Now that's a good price, I can assure you. Um, and so there's anyway, there's a couple of copies. So don't be shy because I really don't want to carry them back. And if you then, and if you see me otherwise hanging out somewhere in a cafe later on at six o'clock, still carrying books, you probably get a discount. But I wouldn't count on it. Um, it's uh, well, thank you, thank you, Brian. And yes, we did meet, and 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 places like Ethiopia definitely um, play a role in the way I began to think about development. So. It's actually quite hard. You know, I'm an economist. I'm not a political scientist. And there are some political scientists that are a little bit worried as an economist talking about politics. Uh, and there's actually a lot of economists worried as an economist is talking about politics as well, because economists like to try to ignore it. The problem is, you know, I was a chief economist. I, I'd been an academic and doing what economists, academic economists do these days, and I do them still, randomized controlled trials, little bits and pieces. I do these things. I know how to do them, and I can study all kinds of things, highly technical stuff. But working in a policy environment, as I was at the chief economist, which you should think of, it's like the, the most important, well, the most senior, at least, technocrat in the organization, and DFID, the Department for International Development, was an independent aid agency. And arguably, because we were not controlled in the same way as, for example, USAID is controlled by, by Congress, we were actually had a lot of agency as an agency. We, we could really, we were an agency, really. And we could act and do and think and do things. So we were actually, you know, also quite a big fund, quite an influential in a lot of countries. So once, once I got into this, I had to realize it's not all just development, it's not just about just technical things. And once you, and I actually remember at some point Francois Bourguignon, who was a chief economist at the World Bank, and once he left, he got interested in institutional economics. He started writing on all these things, and I asked him, so Francois, why, why is this? I said, look, once you're inside this world, you see politics all the time. And it's actually politics matters for good economics, Although I would say, for good politics, economics matters as well. And it's these things trying to bring together and trying to actually, and let me tell you a little bit of the thesis of the book. I'll push it, OK? You can question it, and hopefully there's plenty of time for, for discussion. I'll go quite fast, try to get the key ideas around, read the details and far more juicy stories than I will tell you in the book as well, because it's not written as an academic book. It's actually written more as also partly an experiential book to get its, a sense of the case studies, what's going on. Anyway, this is something, 
If you don't know, I would be very surprised to kind of hear it all. And that's actually the number of extreme poor people in the world has declined dramatically. And there is, a, for some reason, a few days ago, I seem to have just about picked a, a, a graph with a slight error. The 2018 number is actually wrong, but it doesn't really matter for the trends. It's, it it uh, doesn't quite matter. But it's the following. You start in 1990 for numbers of extreme poor, using the World Bank definition. Nothing is perfect, not least these kind of numbers. But they give you a good sense. Two billion about 1980, uh, 1990, of which about, you know, close to 800 million in China. That's the Red Party of Sa uh, East Asia. And what we know, that story of the declines in extreme poverty in East Asia, quite dramatically, is starting in that period. We also know the orange bit, which is basically South Asia. Numbers are a little bit more contested than India, but broadly speaking, we're quite confident that until about 2005, there was a bit of a stagnation in the total numbers in South Asia. But then because India then started picking up with some serious poverty reduction as well, it, it actually has gone down a bit. And this is where the overstatement goes a little bit. So it doesn't, didn't go as big down to 2018 as you see here, but it's still going. Uh, it went down until beginning of COVID. The blue thing is sub-Saharan Africa. And that actually the story we know is that actually their poverty is much more persistent. The, ex the number of extreme poor is still, is actually creeping up all the time. And it's probably now, today, the best estimate, late estimates would be about 550 million. And this, the data up to 2017, 2018, we are quite confident about. But actually, we're also pretty confident that at current patterns, by 2030, 90% of extreme poor will be in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, so this is real, this pattern. Okay, that's just the one thing to keep in mind. There's difference, there's heterogeneity. Great success in some places, and actually, it seems to be at the moment, at least, in sub-Saharan Africa, a kind of the, where it really stays behind. Now, actually, Africa is not a country, as they often try to say, and that's important. In fact, even within Africa, you get much more differentiation than that we sometimes think we have. If we go for that same period, countries that start, you know, lots of small countries in Africa, we take the countries that had at least 8 million population and 20% extreme poverty in 1990, there's two of them, we're quite confident that they halved extreme poverty in the numbers. And there's definitely three to five to six that may well have doubled the numbers of extreme poor. And I'm quite confident that they will include Nigeria, that they will include Congo and Madagascar as amongst the top three. Okay? So these are kind of countries where it's doubling and in others it's going down. It's important to know that even in this place that we often seem to want to write off in terms of some of the discourse, there is also difference happening. Things are different for different countries at the moment. It's totally reflected in growth as well. And we don't need to just think, oh, what is it that we want to achieve if we think on, on economic growth in these places? <coughs> there is really no urge there's really no urge to, to think we all need to be like China or we need to be like the East Asian countries. I mean, Indonesia is incredibly impressive. It's probably now 50 years of kind of per capita growth of an average three and a half percent or a very long period of time, all time. It's not Chinese growth rate, there's not a single year that somehow it seems to be approximate Chinese growth, but it does steadily moves up. India, but also Vietnam, doing quite well as well. Nigeria, you see in the picture here in the purple, it's an interesting thing. You see it suddenly jumping up there as well. Well, it had to do a little bit with something to do with the national, the national accounts they revised. Um, I remember going to Nigeria when they were doing the revisions. And I remember asking the head of the statistical office, you know, were you given free hand to do the revisions as carefully as you could? I said, yes, the president said, I could do what I wanted, how I did it, as long as Nigeria became bigger than South Africa. Um, and so, you know, that's the statistic that we, that we got here. Um, Ghana, but also Bangladesh. These are not countries we usually will call successes. I would actually say there are really signs, definitely Bangladesh, probably also Ghana, that are beginning to progress. These are places where poverty has been going down, but also growth has picked up. And Ethiopia, definitely in the period between 2005 and 2020, fast growth. It was uh, amongst the fastest growing economies, if not the fastest growing economy in the decade between 2010 and 2019. And now you get some place like the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where GDP per capita seems to be creeping up a little bit. Yes, it's indeed the case, because by 2010, it was probably about a quarter of the GDP per capita that it had in 1970. 
Now it's a third of what they had in 1970. Okay, so it's recovering a little bit, but it's still very far from where it was. Now, a lot of people talk about these questions, you know, and look, there wouldn't be a development economics class ever to say, okay, why is it that some countries do, do grow faster and, and others go, 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 go slower? And in a way, you know, it's risky terrain to step into it, as yes, there's someone who, who, who was, uh, I was talking to on a public event that's telling me that he cringes when he has another book that tries to explain why these things are happening. And it's true, you should. You should be really concerned. And I'm not the first one, and there will be maybe many more. But I felt like there was something missing. It's the following. You know, I presume that you would score reasonable points in the pub quiz if that was presented to you. Who are these people? And if you don't know any of them, then I think you, know, you may want to read a little bit more and look around. Um, you know, and these are the authors of the best-selling books. You know? Um, you know, for some reason, I don't know whether you could guess why. I, once in a while, I look at Amazon bestseller list these days. And, uh, and what do I discover in development studies? That these guys are still there. You know, these books are written 10 years ago and whatever. These are the books that people still read that probably is in the summer reading for courses on development and so on. And these are the kind of books you have. Now, they're very different. You know, if you've read any of these, you know, Joe Stiglitz's book is very different from Dan Biza Moyo's. It's definitely different from Paul Collier or indeed from the Esther Duflo Banerjee kind of book. They have very different views, but there's something that these books have in common. And what I think they have in common, they like to tell us what to do. They like to tell countries what to do, what they should do, what they should not do. Now, that's, of course, in the nature of, say, economic analysis, is that you're trying to say, you know, what is the impact of a policy? What, is the, what does an intervention do? You know, this is what you do, which is what you don't do. But when you start looking a bit more, what becomes the more compelling and probably arguably the more, more um, um, I was going to say popular, but in policy circles, the ones where you then get, you get that kind of two competing views of what's going on. And so, in fact, all these writings you could probably broadly categorize, I do it a bit more sophisticated in the book, in two kind of views. The one is a bit like Asti Mowgli Robinson, Why Nations Fail. And Why Nations Fail, it's, a, it's an interesting book, it's a great book, you know, and uh, when I was uh, chief economist in DFID, our prime minister instructed us, and well, he gave an interview, I'm sure he never read it, but he gave an interview that that was his favorite book. That's usually a signal that you'd better take it seriously. And Paul Collier was a bit annoyed because actually, we know that David Cameron read Paul Collier's book and, never, and don't think he ever read Why Nations Fail. But politically, this was an attractive book for a conservative politician in the UK, because what does the book tell you? Uh, broadly speaking, if you were lucky to look like Britain, or one of its offshoots, like here, then uh, you'll be successful and the rest is crap. And the rest is all going wrong. And somehow or another, of course, Britain comes out very well, but it says something more subtly and more sophisticated if you take that literature forward. They're, all, they're often economic historians. And they actually will tell you that these institutional, these institutions in the, in the spirit of Douglas North, you know, the, the, not just the formal rule of law and structures and the constitution, but also the norms and values, they get shaped slowly over time histo over, through history. Now, the problem is that when you take that seriously, that's not evidence that we can actually quickly fix these. And even though a lot of the programs that we end up doing in that space, and we hear a like World Bank or others saying we do governance work because we want to fix the institutions, that's not quite what the evidence tells us, because they, the evidence tells us, at least if you take that literature, they are slowly shaped through history. In fact, the most honest advice that I could go and give to President Buhari in Nigeria, as a UK official, if I believe that's my only framework I should use, is to... Uh, pres Mr. President, I think you should get yourself a better history. It's a bit tricky for the Brits to tell them that, <laughs> but it's basically what actually the implication is. And if you know these papers where they all base themselves on, that's a lot to do with historical predetermines get us different trajectories in growth. Now, that's a problem with the advice. Now, there's nothing in what I'll say next that institutions don't matter. In fact, Lena Wanshokon, the, the, the economic historian economist at Princeton, he has a nice line, he said, it's about, if we look at today what's going on, it's about 50% history on average in Africa. Oops. It's about 50%. Okay. Well, what's the other percent then? Well, 
it likely has to do with something with actions and behaviors. It's to do with policies. And of course, a lot of these books will tell us then, like the Paul Colliers of the world will tell us, you know, this and this and this and all be fixed. You know, you'll get, get the, the list of things that you need to sort out. But in fact, there's quite a lot of things. If you read some of these authors, it's not like very precise as an economist would want to be doing. There is no clarity exactly what needs to be done. In fact, there was a review at the World Bank, actually, uh, fund, or organized by the World Bank, which was the Growth Commission. Michael Spence, a Nobel Prize winner, was leading it. And they looked, I think it was around 2008 it got published, they looked at countries that had grown 7% for more than 30 years. And they, they found about, I vaguely remember, is it 12 or 14, I can't remember. But, you know, East Asian countries, of course, predominantly, but others there as well. And they looked at what did they have in common in terms of their growth policies. And once you read it, you get parts of the book, parts of that report that says like, yeah, macroeconomic stability matter, mattered, but, well, sometimes they did it with a fixed exchange rate, sometimes with a flexible one. Sometimes they overvalued it, sometimes they systematically undervalued it. But broadly speaking, it was macroeconomic stability. So that's not a precise piece of advice. They say things like infrastructure matters. Yeah, OK, infrastructure matters. Education matters. Yes, obviously. Health will matter at some point. Yes, of course. Um, market orientation matters, but not simply liberalize everything. OK, yeah, where are we now? Put it slightly differently. When you start reading it, when you look at the experience of countries, they didn't do the first best that, for example, the IMF would prescribe. They didn't do the first best that, that some of the practices in the World Bank would describe, or indeed my treasury in the UK would tell us that I needed to defend. They didn't all, as for example, the policy line was for us of advisory work, it always had to in include uh, capital market liberalization as a priority, suits the UK quite well. And, uh, and, in, and in fact, once when I dared to relatively publicly argue, maybe a bit of capital controls at this stage is not a bad idea. I got whistled back from my treasury, which fortunately as an independent agency, I could put up the metaphorical finger and ignore them, but, um, which I don't think USAID could do. Um, but you know, you get this, you know, because actually there may be moments if you say, either for opportune moments, maybe even for political economy moments, that you actually say, look, there's certain things we can't do first best, we need to think about it. But once you actually create that space that actually more things are possible, okay? Not stupid things. There are lots of stupid things in the economy you can't do. And that's, you can basically say, no, no, you don't do that. That's quite clear. But it's not as if there is a very clear, indeed, a very clear recipe. Indeed, that was the famous line from this report. We don't know the recipe, but we know the ingredients. But we can bake a lot of cakes with these ingredients. And they can actually look a bit different. And so, the question then becomes, why don't they? Why don't countries do sensible things? At least as seen from growth and development. Why don't they do broadly sensible things? And if it goes wrong, they correct and they do something else and they try and they learn and whatever. And hopefully they do relatively sensible things that are evidence-based, but especially why don't they actually even try to do something and then correct themselves if it goes wrong? And I came home, uh, that, that, that thought really crystallized in my mind when I was as chief economist invited to two government departments. Prime Minister's office on the left-hand side in Kinshasa. And then the right-hand side, the Prime Minister's office in Ethiopia. In Kinshasa, they didn't care that I took a picture of it. Ethiopia, actually, they don't, there are no pictures of the Prime Minister's office. It's a particular regime, okay? At the time, this was Melis, uh, just after Melis Dantana's death, but it was... Particular, okay? These are, let's, neither of them are open societies as we like to see them necessarily, but they were quite different. And especially that was illustrated by the meetings I had with them. In the first one in Congo, they had a room full of very smartly dressed young men presenting, these young men were presenting the plans for development that Minister, Prime Minister Ponyo were going to do. And they had a plan for macroeconomic stability, for convertibility, for infrastructure development, for agriculture, for special economic zones, for all the kind of thing. Actually, it was really quite interesting. For the whole morning, we listened to these things that were actually made a lot of sense. Actually, they were pretty good. Actually, in Washington, they should be quite pleased with it that that's the plans. In fact, as an academic also, I said, look, that's actually quite smart because it is 
quite sensible for the local circumstances. They thought about it, and they actually have really sensible plans. I remember walking out of that meeting, it was about 2013, and the Congolese counterpart, well, not a counterpart, the one in the embassy that was the governor's advisor, and he said, quel spectacle, what a show we've just seen. What a piece of theater we've just seen. And the piece of theater was basically because we both knew nothing would happen. This was a piece of show that was never going to be implemented. In fact, the day before had been at the Ministry, Ministry of Budget. They do a bit of the French, the Francophone countries thing. Budget and finance are different. Ministry of Budget, we went there. And it was the 11th year of the fiscal year. The 11th month, sorry, of the fiscal year. The 11th month. And he said, oh, you know what? We think that this week we may all get our budgets for the current year approved <laughs> in Parliament. <laughs> OK, so look, don't expect too much. In Ethiopia, it was very different. They actually had asked for a retreat of the senior economic policymakers and building on an idea that um, and actually we pinched from Joe Stiglitz. We were earlier briefly talking about it, that he used that, had done that in the late 1990s with the prime minister. And we had picked up that as well. And for several years during this period, 13 to 17, every year we had a short retreat where we brought in, where we brought, brought in experts on economic policy making, and they would present where they were with their plans and what they were going to do. And so we had the finance minister, the prime minister's advisors, the deputy prime minister was always told to be there, and so on and so on. And we brought people like Paul Collier, Justin Lin, uh, Land Pritchard. These were the three in that event. Now, anyone who knows vaguely these names, these are very different people, you know, very different in terms of what they stand for. But we listened to the plans again, and they were presenting it. And I remember it was real, lots of heated discussion. It was close, confidential, so we all were criticizing and saying, look, it's all going to be tricky, tricky for the macroeconomy, this is all going to be thing. And, 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 and it was actually very tricky plans. Let's say from an economics point of view, it's, it, the heterodox didn't cover it. It was like, you know, a bit tricky. Okay, there I say it was a bit of a gamble, okay? That was some things that we had. But I remember walking out of the room and all of us of the outsiders agreeing First of all, they're going to do this, isn't it? And secondly, they may well be successful. They may well actually find a way of making this work. And in fact, Ethiopia became the fastest growing economy in that decade in Africa and maybe well in per capita terms even in the world. So that was actually kind of striking. So very different experience. One presents the first best of best practice. The other one much more modeled. The other one is more successful. Not because the economics was right, but something else. And that's what I want to actually briefly allude to even just with one quote from Douglas North from a book that if you have never read, it's always worth looking at, Violence and Social Orders, uh, where basically it takes this view, which is others take this view as well. Maybe you could say there's a, something going back to Max Weber even, that the idea of a state is closely linked to the, the, the control of violence. Uh, Max Weber's line of um, the, the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. But basically something more, it's not just a control of peace, but also it's an element of control of resources and access. Yeah? And basically, as you can see it there, it's basically a deal in politics and the economics of how to actually a state will be run. I think actually most states, we should look at that. You know, there will be all kinds of forms. North had this bit of view, 34 countries seem to have sorted it all out and the rest is all a mess. I don't like that. You know, we all have, in our societies, very arguably, if you start thinking about the peculiar things, think of Britain, and I know it applies here as well, but Britain is a nice example. If I happen to be in Britain, uh, and I have as an ancestor, someone who ca carried the sword of a Norman knight that came in 1066 with William the Conqueror, there's a good chance you're still a millionaire because you would have been given land in return and you still own it now because inheritance laws basically is a way that the elite gets the whole structure pro progressed. I'm not trying to argue abolish inheritance rights. We just should be conscious. We shouldn't take it for granted that it's logical in a society that we are, that we think is equal opportunity and so on. So anyway, well once we get to that, and that's the framework I use, let's look at societies as a bargain, as, an, as a deal between People with power or influence, who I think of, well, that's not just, and it's really important, not just the prime minister or the president or uh, the cabinet. This will be senior civil servants. This will be senior military. This will include, of course, senior business leaders. 
This will be include probably even civil society, journalists, public intellectuals. They are the elite. Can be small, can be broad. And think of it as a state always that they are there. You know, if I go to certain countries, they recognize that. 50 families in one structures that they recognize in Latin America or uh, the 50 families in Bangladesh, as I heard say, there's about 50 families that run Bangladesh. So that's, you have to understand that. Now, that's nothing, that's a descriptive statement, okay? That's not a normative statement. It's, it's a bargain where the state can function when it's at, at the least a coalition for peace and stability. You need to have that. And it tends to involve something about who controls the state and who has access to resource and distribution. So the basic point, and in fact, it's a key part of the book, you could have lots of these different ones. You could have basically a deal. At that moment, this is where the agency comes into it, where actually it's, it's largely about I'm controlling the state now, and I will basically give the, as much as I can the resources to my friends and family or those who supported it or supported me to get in power. Some kind of either patronage state or indeed uh, clientelist that I reward those who support me. And the state can be built up essentially clientelist way, and you get a particular state. You know, again, I don't make a strong normative statement, but that's what you have. You could also get a quite a kleptocratic state where basically the state becomes an instrument to steal from everybody. It's not just distribution, but just stealing and then further controlling the, the rents from it. Mobutu Sese Seko in the Congo, in Zaire at the time, springs to mind. He had this great saying uh, to his own team, civil servants. He gave this wonderful speech at some point. And uh, he actually had a way with words, you know. It's worth learning French just to read Mobutu's, uh, hear Mobutu's speeches. And he had this line, you know, very publicly and said, yes, we had compla complaints about corruptions from the people. We hear it all the time. You hear it all the time. Isn't that true? And say, yes, you hear it all the time. Maybe can I give you a piece of advice? And the piece of advice is, if you have to steal, steal a little and leave something for the next civil servant. <laughs> And um, yeah, OK, if you do that openly, that's clearly how you then uh, uh, look at it. Now that comes to the basic thesis of the book. If we want growth and development, it's not just a matter of giving them the list of things to do. It's actually underlying just actually being committed to do it. The minimal amount is an underlying commitment. And in fact, when you start looking at these very diverse countries with very diverse political systems, with very diverse ways of looking at the market and what the state was doing or not, all within confines, nothing too crazy, all kind of still a bit some reason within it. What they seem to have in common is an underlying commitment to growth and, 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 and development. And one of the problems is in the discourse on development is that when we started 50, 60 years talking about development and about aid, it was the countries like the Nordics or Western Europeans or the US who had already gone well past that, that, that phase. If you go back to 19th century Britain, you can't take that for granted. That's what the state, but that's what you're trying to do. You can't take that for granted in the US. You know, you can't take for granted, how, think of how controversial the idea of a new deal was and doing that in your society. So you basically get something that we took it for granted, not least the Nordics who, who totally had forgotten that actually in the 19th century, Sweden was a very unequal society and actually took really in the 20th century to get, get some of these changes. Anyway, it has to be more than words, it has to be about actions. It has to be, first of all, that you are very smart in handling your elite bargain to keep stability. Because that's the minimal amount, you know. This also means, that's why the leader is not enough. You can have a leader, say, in some Latin American countries, a leftist leader comes to power, wants to do all kinds of things. You know, it's so easily, easily done by other parts in the elite to disturb it. Think of Peru, the way the parties totally keep on disturbing anything anyone tries to do in recent times. So the, you have to have actually, to be able to have that, you need to think about how do I keep the stability in the system. It's not just a radical agenda. It's actually, can I actually find a way of getting it done in terms of stability? Now secondly, and this comes back to the idea of the clientelist state or not, this is not the developmental state thesis. This is not it, because the developmental state worked in a very particular circumstance. Typically in societies, that had a long history of a centralized state that was functioning. Think of China, 2,000 years of meritocratic bureaucracy, 2,000 years of centralized taxation. Look, if I somehow randomly want to pick a country where I want to do state-run development, I would pick China, because that's the history of that place that actually that's a lot of it you do. 
I'm not going to pick Malawi, where the state is just built up since independence, totally clientelist. In fact, I can't think of many African countries I would pick. Interestingly, Ethiopia centralized taxation from about 1870. And so there is something there that actually helps to understand why Ethiopia could get so far in that period and why Kenya probably could never do the Ethiopia model. And I remember traveling around, knowing Ethiopia quite well, whether I was with ANC leaders in South Africa, whether I was with Buhari's team in, uh, in Nigeria, and said, what's that thing there that this Meles guy is doing? You know, what are they doing? And say, look, you can't. That's not you. That was my best advice. You need to find something that's going to work with your nature of your state, and you need to be self-aware enough. And that's the thing that, you know, and I need to find the right words in the sense of Bangladesh was very striking. They came out of a period of conflict, of course, independence, the famine linked to the cyclone in the 1970s, uh, huge political instability, an initial attempt to do, a, as, a, as a child of its time, centralized economy and getting socialist state build up or whatever, that actually in the 1980s, bits and pieces were undone of that and policies were quite sensible, but also space emerged for a state that wasn't leading everything. And you got a space where NGOs were getting really strong in developing social sectors, where you get BRAC, the largest NGO in the world now, actually emerging as a key agent of delivering social sectors uh, uh, provision. You know, just look around how other countries try to repress NGOs because they are a challenge. In Bangladesh, they could grow. I call that a self-aware state that actually knows what it can do and can't do. And now finally, you need to be willing to do corrections. And our final point here, and that's related to accountability and learning. You need to have some system either internally in your bureaucracy or in your politics and bureaucracy or maybe externally that holds you to account. And that's where the difference comes. In China, this weren't economic reforms that Deng Xiaoping did. They like to call it governance reforms. It's like who is responsible for delivering what and how are you held to account? When the targets were pushed down, lower down in the system, that's what it is. You create an internal accountability and actually individuals have to be held to account. I like to say when I was at the World Bank, you know, they, they, they invented payment by results, outcome-based financing. And the outcome was if you basically didn't use the money well to re re deliver the results, you were out. <laughs> and that was the outcome-based financing. You lost your job if you didn't deliver the targets. And that's actually, you know, you set the incentives internally. Now, again, in a clientelist state, I can't see it happening. And that's also then probably why, say, in Kenya or in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Ghana, where you see some progress, the, external, the accountability has to come externally, where you see the stability in the politics could be achieved in Ghana in the 1990s with the constitutional reform. Political elite played by the rules of the game, which were actually not totally open. You're not allowed to, for example, form a party that is, based, that is locally based, so to speak, one region. You have to have a cross-regional party. That's a constrained democracy. But actually, a political elite was willing to play it. Stability was broadly maintained. There's a bit of a tricky thing these days. And actually, it created a space for actually development to happen largely also from outside, from the private sector in a place like that. So that's the kind of things. Of course, it helps to explain there. The elite bargain in the DRC, what is it about? Well, I remember going there, and one of the striking things that's, that uh, basically we learned that um, uh, Joseph Kabila, so the son of uh, Laurent Désiré, so the, the son, uh, he was in power then, and no leader could ever see Joseph Kabila because he was always, he was busy. In fact, we all knew what he was doing. He was addicted to computer games, and that was the only thing he did. Because he didn't have to care at all anything with policymaking or whatever. The only deal he needed to do is whether his family kept enough control of the control of the, of the contracts of the natural resources. Just look in some Panama Papers and the like, you'll find his family there. Um, all the way to, you know, multinationals, you know, if you want to tell, uh, actually everybody says, isn't it amazing, telecom works in the DRC, even there it works. Just check carefully what the joint venture is, which family is the co-shareholder with Vodafone uh, in, that, in that business, it's the sister, um, that's actually part of it. You know, you, that's the things they're interested in. It's the deal making around natural resources and the, and the derivatives, not at all, at all by the agricultural growth and whatever. Ethiopia, they were really staking their survival of their political bargain, and we can talk about more of that in question if you want, but they really were staking it. It's politically unstable, as we now discovered. Very difficult. 
peaceful transitions in Ethiopia happened apparently twice since the 17th century. So this is, we could maybe some people say, oh no, no, it's wrong what you say, it's about four or five times. Okay, fine, I'm happy with any of these numbers. And it's really tricky to get the, the, the nation, nation building happening there. It's not because of colonialism, but more that it's history itself. And as a result, they gambled on getting legitimacy as a regime based on the economy. And that was what Meles Zenawi did. He'd take this legitimacy, a bit similar to Deng Xiaoping, actually. He was a student of East Asia. To actually think about, he's going to do this uh, legitimacy-seeking behavior because I can't get it through a political means. In fact, he had just lost the elections in 2005 and had to fudge them to, um, to, 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 um, uh, to, to stay in power. So what I have in mind here is actually something that Yuan Wen Ang, if you ever want to read a nice book on China on this period, it's actually, uh, she wrote this book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, which is really very interesting and wants to make this case that actually China was institutionally really weak at that moment, not strong. And that actually didn't have perfect institutions. And it wasn't the choice between the state and the market. We see that in these hybrid models everywhere. Come on, look at our own countries. You know, we do all kinds of things in our economies all the time. And these days we see it even more than before. It's not about choice between the market or the state. It's finding what actually works to actually make the progress in your own setup. It's not about simply autocracy or democracy. You know, you may need a, a, a democracy as an external accountability, but we see autocratic regimes taking off. I'm not making a statement what it will happen when they reach middle income or beyond. I make a statement on the early stages. And empirically, it's hard to argue that one or the other necessarily gets us more results. Put it simply, um, DRC has, has features definitely as an autocracy and does terribly. China, of course, also and did really well. Ghana and Kenya are doing better now. They are democracies, and Malawi is a democracy too. And it's no, nothing is ever happening in Malawi. Anyway, and I think I've mentioned these things. Now I want to finally emphasize in terms of the conceptualization, it is a gamble. It is a gamble you take, and that's really important to think. Why is it a gamble? For an elite, the status quo is so attractive. You know exactly the positions you're in. You have the blocking power of everything. That's also why popular movements may or may not change that much here because they have the blocking power. Think of Latin America, all the time movements. Does it really manage to unlock the elites? It's hard. I'm not trying to give up on social movements. I just want to argue that we shan't assume that that will ever work because that, that's what an elite has. It's an incentive for status quo, an incentive to block, which makes it then quite interesting when do they gamble? Often when they reach fragility in their, in their circumstances coming out of crisis like in Bangladesh, like in China, like in Ethiopia, and so on. These are moments that potentially there's opportunities, or then seek legitimacy, although I don't want to give up simply what is the other part is that Leonard wants to consent. If it's 50% based on history and structures, it's 50% agency, people acting actually for the good of a country. But acting for the good of the country, you need to make sure that it's takes these elite groups, the blocking powers with them. And that's the, hard, that's the hard part of the politics of development. Of course, it makes it surprising that so many countries did it in recent times. Because I'm actually quite optimistic. I showed you the figures that this is happening. Anyway, so it's not just words. It has to be actions and behavior. It probably goes against interest of the elite, vested interests. So it is actually looking for a way to keep the stability in it while trying to progress. Really tough task and so on. And I think I've said these things. In the book, I talk about all these countries, and a bit more, in fact. But you place them there. Some are kind of emerging, that you kind of say there's a bit of hope that it can happen. There's some actions and behaviors consistent with it. Some actually clearly are there, although Rwanda and Ethiopia always have a question mark for me how sustainable it is, given the setup. And then Nigeria, yeah, Nigeria is Nigeria. I mean, it's, it's an elite bargain still even though other people want to argue slightly differently. But if you keep on looking at the data, it's basically an economy that exports one thing, which is oil, and the rest of the economy is non-tradable. So that by implication, that's an economy that recycles the oil to actually do that non-tradable activity. The whole finance industry, all the dynamic stuff of Lagos, that's not tradable stuff. I keep on telling these guys, they asked me, I was presenting for, for groups of Nigerians, quite wealthy ones, and they asked me, so what can we do? You know, to try to export something. The day I buy something that is made in Nigeria, I will be rejoicing. But of course, 
The elite bargain is such that it's so important to keep control of the oil rents, so important to keep the exchange rate crazily overvalued, or indeed, as we have now, something like 6 to 12 exchange rates. Depending on who you know, you get another exchange rate from the central bank, which is, let's say, not quite efficient nor fair. Um, and you basically get an economy that is just not going anywhere. And it's, um, yeah, how can agriculture take off if imports are so cheap? How can almost anything, you know, the striking difference I had in trips recently to Nigeria and, and Dhaka, I didn't see Mercedes in Bangladesh on the roads. I saw plenty of them in Abuja because they're cheap if your exchange rate is so overvalued and so on and so on and so on. So you get countries that actually are quite stuck. Let me finish here. What can outsiders do? I know I'm talking a bit too long. Finishing here. Well, the one thing that I don't think will do it is things like this. I was in New York talking to the UNICEF people and the UN people. They actually totally bought it. I said, that's fine. You know, as long as next week we can celebrate it all. But think. But I'll tell you why. So, so you could say, and in fact, someone early on argued, aren't the SDGs, for example, and a global elite bargain between the elites of the world to actually achieve shared goals. So yeah, but it's not quite a deal that has any credibility. Or put it slightly differently, you know, what incentives does anyone on this picture really have to deliver anything? There is nothing here. There is no way of making this a credible contract. In fact, it's worse than that. I think it's really risking making it worse. And it's in the following way. You could look at who's on that picture, in fact. And in the UN, I couldn't quite point out that Vladimir Putin is on this picture as well. He signed the SDGs as well. But not just that. If you go to developing countries, a country that tries to develop in its own way, I will simply say it doesn't need the UN to go there and be celebrated, although maybe it's nice, but it doesn't change anything. Now, it's extremely easy to sign. This was the Millennium Declaration, so it's the one picture where all the leaders were together on the picture in 2000. It's probably the, historically, this is going to be such a historical picture. There's never going to be as many world leaders together on the same picture for the next 20 years again. Um, but you start looking at who's there. Several people that basically are from countries where there's no elite bargain for development, or the word that I use, there is no development bargain. They are essentially, you know, the ones that, really have totally different objectives where they want to go. These are also people indicted by the International Court of Justice. They are people that are known for grand corruption. These are people of like that. What legitimacy do you give them by putting them on these pictures with all the others that actually try to do it? And you make them all look as if they're all the same. And you actually don't celebrate the ones who try to do something. In fact, you diminish the ones who are trying to do something by having all the crooks around you. And that's why I don't like it. Okay? There's many more things as well, but that's another matter. There's a whole chapter in the book about it. Um, I had to get it off my chest, you know? Um, the, the book was therapy for me, I can assure you. Um, but now make the distinction, what you then can do. And okay, so there's nothing that I said, and even though people worry about it, and I want to not go away with saying, oh, we should give on aid, or give up on development assistance. Actually, not at all. This is not Bill Easterly, not William Easterly talking to you and saying, now the conclusion is, let's give up and we're all doomed and we better stay away and we can't do anything. I want to simply say, first of all, we have to have some humility. It's really hard as outsiders to do something. And that's a very good starting point, which is not necessarily celebrated in some other buildings in this, in this neighborhood. Uh, you want to be, you know, you're not running the world. In fact, I kept on, I gave a talk in the World Bank, I said, you are not policymakers, and if you think you are, there's something wrong with you, because the policymakers are in the countries. They need to determine their destiny. You are advisors, at best, okay? And so don't do that. But we can do something, and in fact, there are countries, you saw it in the data, some countries that have been growing faster and being quite inclusive. In fact, there's more in the book on describing these things. That's about lots of indicators where there is progress. These are countries that I think have settled onto a development bargain. Amongst multiple bargains they could have between the elite, they had one where growth and development featured in it. You know, they're still lining their pockets and so on. I'm not trying to say that, but they are actually progressing and people get a better life. Now, in these countries, it is easy. And we should just be willing to spend it. And we should actually stop having endless milestones and control systems and payment by results and other kind of nonsense. We just support them. And in fact, all the models, say, of the World Bank actually are quite okay for that. 
You just support them. You extend the balance sheet of the government. You work with them. In fact, like people like me, these are the places where my little RCTs are incredibly useful because I can pass on what we think what works and there would be people interested, like you have in some states in India, they're really interested in applying these things. So you work with them. Or indeed, as it was the case in Western Kenya, where if I asked one of my predecessors, sorry, Western Kenya, in Western, that's the RCT thing that distracted me. I said, I want to say Western China, where some of my predecessors as chief economist, I asked something, where was the UK aid most effective in these terms, in terms of getting done what works? They said Western, Ch Western China in the poverty alleviation because the government desperately wanted it and you had the best partnerships to actually make progress. Okay, you can ask yourself, mm, was this right? And indeed, there's lots of people today that may worry about it, but that's the fact. You have total alignment with their interests in terms of delivering the poverty alleviation and then you can do work. So there's lots of places you can do that. And I want to do this liberally, you know? I won't want to have a little scorecard here, like some organizations like MCC have, that is so much a projection of what we have here and the kind of the perfection. No, don't make the good uh, the enemy of the, no, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, okay? Don't try to somehow have these um, ideas. For example, the word corruption, let's unpack this a little bit. I don't like corruption, by the way. Don't get that wrong. But there are places where maybe it's not the first thing you may want to address. There may be other things you want to address, not because they will grow out of it, as Jeff Sachs used to say, but more because actually it may destabilize the elite bargain so much that you can't make any progress in anything else. And you want to think carefully about it. So you want to think about it, what you do. In Indonesia in the early, in the early, uh, in the early 70s, Suharto came to power after a real conflictual, and he was part of the army that killed so many people in the countryside. He came to power in Indonesia, and, but there was an old elite that really didn't like the coup he had done. They controlled the state-run ent enterprises, but Suharto had to deliver because there was no legitimacy. So we ended up inviting investors from Japan, highly controversial with the old elite. And investment came in. Now we know that in the end, these actions created the growth and the, and the poverty reduction, the labor intensive growth and so on. But he actually let the old elite control the state owned en uh, enterprises then. Arguably they were corrupt. Yes, they were rent, rent creation places. But actually, probably if he had tried to attack them then, or we had pushed him to attack them then, or the Japanese had said, we can't invest in you because you have that corruption there, the elite bargain probably would have broken down and it would have been deposed in a coup straight away. So I'm not saying that I like that story. I'm just trying to tell you the story, what you need to understand, that sometimes these things work within the whole system what you have. And you need to try to understand what's going on. Having said that, I want us to be very cautious with countries that have very little uh, sign of a development bargain. If they're not trying to actually get the economy to grow and be inclusive in development, then, well, what's the point of it? Then say, well, look, there's lots of people still starving in northern Nigeria. There's lots of people there, and it's neat. The health indicators in northern Nigeria are dreadful. It's, of course, also a country that spends the smallest share of its national budget on health in the whole of Africa, probably the world. So what are we doing? Are we compensating all the time for 60 years for a government that really refuses to do anything on the health of its own? It's a huge moral dilemma. I'm not saying that I know the answer, but I say, well, you better think once in a while a bit about it and not blindly assume, surely we need to do this. You need to think about it. Is there maybe things we can do to then maybe unlock something or whatever? And don't call doing good Development. Development is about change, serious change, and not just about doing good, a small number of children here and there. I love us to do good, but that's not what we do. So give well if you want, but, uh, but that's not development as we know it. Anyway, I need to finish here now. Um, what can we do? Interestingly, we can do things with global public goods, not the usual ones that they always talk about. Of course all the climate change or whatever, but targeting, what can you do to actually target those development bargains that are non-development? Development. It's interesting, you know, trade and trade access has been a powerful means for political change in a lot of countries. And the way it works is that if you are export-oriented, you need to keep the, uh, the economy 
somehow, not, don't count over value exchange rate too much. You need to actually keep a sensible set of economic policies because you have to meet yourself with, uh, with international markets. So it's not just that you learn from international markets, as the economists would say. You actually, on top of that, have a virtuous cycle that actually it restrains the extent of rent-seeking that can take place in your own economies. And that's actually something, probably, that's what we did. We didn't really realize, but that's probably why that openness plays such a role in all these things. The other one is that, much more recently, what f there's a lot of people talk about tax havens, how awful they are. Yeah, they're quite awful, but I hate the word tax havens. That's not a problem. Tax is not a problem. I never want to give Buhari more money or Kabila more money. Actually, these are instruments of political finance. And that's what we can't, can't, should be breaking. In fact, massive opportunity. We are a country of the rule of law here in the US or in Europe, in the UK as well. We change our bills now. Suddenly, we want to go after the oligarchs in Russia. Actually, the laws get changed. We suddenly can do something we could never do to some of these kind of leaders and, and, and business elites in these countries. This is our decade where we can start addressing this. And, and that's an unintended consequence from the Ukraine conflict, but we can take an opportunity. In countries, well, I kind of would be tempted to say, you just listen to Brian once in a while of how you try to do it, and be as optimistic as he is that you can actually do it. That you're actually working inside the system, trying to gut nudge, nudge what's going on in the bureaucracies or in the elite bargains, to actually nudge them to do the right thing. I think you can do things, the book has a whole chapter on it, you want to be careful. But it's hard because we're outsiders, that's all I want to say. So don't assume that every time you spend some money on civil society, you'll have a result. You can spend endless money on civil society for transparency in Nigeria, and I can assure you, most of these investments thus far have zero return. Because as one, someone from an NGO said to me, these are the kind of regimes that don't give a damn. So the don't give a damn regimes, you can't really do. You need supply and demand if you want to do some pressure. They need to be someone recipient of the pressure, which is why electoral programs, for example, and on ground transparency and outcome-based stuff in Kenya and in Ghana have been so effective because the system is there now that actually you can influence what MPs do and so on. So the final thing, and I really run out of, of thing, I'm just going to put it quickly, just be a bit more hard-nosed, not just about what to do, but think about how to get it done. And politics will play into it, all kinds of other stuff. And don't leave how to get it done as researchers over to these guys in the World Bank with the suits that claim that they know how to do it. Sorry, I didn't want to target you. <laughs> but what I meant actually more the negotiators of the loans and all the things, the ones that you were also supporting, uh, had to support. But I'm thinking, oh, we know how to do, we know how to work in Nigeria. No, no, don't assume you know how to work in these places. It's more than also doing papers on this stuff. You know, something I keep on telling to the research department in the World Bank, you know. A GPG only has a return if the marginal benefit is more than zero. Supplying public goods only is really a supply if the marginal benefit is high. So basically, someone needs to use your stuff as researchers, as academics. And it's more than political economy analysis, because it's not just laying out the complexity. It's thinking through scenarios and how you actually can actually get change. In the world of aid, I've said it. You know, when the science and development bargains support them, we're not just be more carefully because you can, you risk embedding structures worse. And I knew that applies even in humanitarian aid. One of the worst moments that I, in my, in my work period, when I realized something really I'd never thought of before, this was going in a UN, with a UN helicopter in 2070s to Ganyil in South Sudan, flying into rebel held territory basically the airstrip there, where the food aid was being distributed. And we saw around the airstrip, all the NGOs had their offices and a big warehouse, but we didn't see a single soldier in sight. So I was very puzzled. I thought, you know, look, surely that needs to be protected. That's, this is a war zone something. Of course, I don't know anything about conflict, clearly, because I went to talk to the rebel commander, and the rebel commander said, oh, no, we don't need guards there. They are our friends, the NGOs. They've been here for 20 years giving emergency aid. Okay, and get a bit worse then. And he said, well, they allow me to get on with the business of war. And then I kind of think, you want to be very careful with doing good, because you may make it worse. And that you want to uh, keep on there. And then we'll do very much lots of effort to make it worse in the next decade, because geopolitics is bad. 
in the 1980s, we made a lot of stuff worse, to quote Lyndon B. Johnson. You know, there's more of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, support lots of bastards because they're our bastards. And, uh, and that's actually a real danger in the end. Anyway, you buy the book, there's some more stories there. Thank you. Hi, uh, Peter Lewis. I teach here at SICE. Um, a, a quick comment and a, and a question. Um, the, the comment is, I mean, you made a distinction between these bargains and the developmental state and so forth, but I would uh, just observe that even in developmental states, the vaunted, you know, stories that we all know, China more recently, but, you know, Japan and South Korea and Singapore and so forth, they all made course corrections. They all had shocks. They all had... Uh, uh, problems and, and deficiencies. And so I think any developmental project, uh, whether it's a, a, a pure developmental state or, or a more intermediate bargain, that has to be part of the equation. That's the other thing um, that I want to just ask quickly is that if I hear your argument, I think there's kind of two components to it. One component is corralling the politicians. How to get the politicians on board sufficiently so that they'll pursue decent policies, allow decent policies, facilitate the work of the bureaucracy, and so forth. The second piece of it, though, which I, I'd like you to uh, drill down on a little bit, is alliances with producers. And producers can be, you know, manufacturers with a factory of 200 people, or a producer can be a peasant farmer with, you know, a hectare, uh, who might be able to improve yields uh, given the right incentives. So how do you begin to elicit the kind of confidence and investments from producers that really gives you bumps in growth. Um, so I'll, t I'll, I'll take one more. These were kind of two comments or one question comment. I'll take, take, take a little bit more if I may. Yeah. I like my degrees of freedom. Hi. Um, could you talk a bit more about how to judge whether a development bargain is in place? Yeah. That is, how do you make sure that it's not just anecdotal things that you see where yes. there are some stories of corruption and more have a kind of objective metric of whether or not it's uh, the kind of Absolutely. Yeah, regime you want. Thanks. So, so, so let, me, let me take these and I will do very quickly another round. So the, so the first point, and, and, and of course I agree with your comment on the course corrections. In fact, it's an essential part. I think where I wanted to, for a moment, not say it's a development state, was more on this perception, for example, I had it even when presenting the, the book, especially African audience, saying, well, development state is really attractive for us in Africa, with a kind of perception as if developmental state translates quickly to state-led development. And that nuance gets easily lost in the jargon, that development state and state-led development. So that's all, the only thing that I wanted to say. This is not a simple state-led development type of argument, as often development state, but you know, uh, even well, far better than I do, it's much more nuanced in that sense. The course correct, correction is the interesting part, which is basically linked to that second point, is that you know, the corralling of, of the politicians, but also the business elite, that they actually they, 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 their actions are becoming, becoming broadly more, more aligned, aligned with this. So, so, and, and I think your question is a bit like, <laughs> how do you know? And that's what you said. It's a little bit linked to that, how do you know? And so, so there, there is one, one is the defensive point I'll make, which is simply that in our quest to have the predictors, we end up always having to go back in history. And so the agency point is removed. Uh, so this is why you know, I do not think there's an indicator in 1960 in Polity 5 or even in 19, uh, five years ago in Polity 5 that properly predicts what it is. But of course, it will constrain the feasible options. Let's think of the historical, indi the, the predictors there, there are certain characteristics that will constrain the feasible set. So history constrains the feasible set. But then it becomes action and behaviors. And there I'll get all the time in trouble, but 
to in answer in general and then your specific point. So there is one thing here that clearly it will become context specific because change cannot follow this linear trajectory that everywhere it will be the same. When I make this example on corruption, there will be places where you say, look, in Malawi, I think tackling the underlying procurement fraud is at the core of trying to get some change in the elite bargain of the controlling the state. In Indonesia, it clearly wasn't at the core to do it. So that's the kind of thing there. So you need to get a judgment of all these things that probably get us on the way to whether it's somewhat better institution, but especially set better incentives towards growth and development in the political elite and the business elite, is that you have, but the sequence of it will be different. Now, I think, and I can't prove it, but I think that I, first of all, I have a reasonable case to be able to do something like this that is slightly more context specific, not least if at the moment, the best correction, the only correction we ever do context specific, like in World Bank financing, is something a senior economist fills in quickly what the CPIA is, the, 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 the kind of governance indicators of that. To actually say, look, if, if that we feel is good enough, then I definitely can offer something better that actually captures better, which would be actually trying to think through. You know, it could even do one of these uh, eliciting uh, perceptions type of work uh, around it in saying, look, if I went to a room with people that worked on Malawi in the, in the country with local experts and, and so on, and trying to even get, you know, what do we think that the five things would be that we probably need to start unlocking here to actually have confidence? Now, first of all, we, we scrap the low-hanging fruits because there's a reason why they're low-hanging fruits. Low-hanging fruits are low-hanging because nothing gets disturbed. <laughs> nothing gets changed. So, so that's something. It's all fine to spend money on, but they're low-hanging because nothing gets disturbed. It's not the things that are impossible to change. So it's not like revolution and, and regime change and whatever. But it's somewhere in between. So in Malawi, I would know, I would probably have ATMARC, the Agriculture Market Power Statel, definitely high on the list as the key instrument where it's very clear that political interest and procurement fraud, that's where it all happens. Uh, this is in the book a story about I even burnt my fingers. Not that I got involved in the corruption, but it was more embarrassment, um, explaining at great length with a lot of time spent to a particular person who ended up within weeks afterwards was arrested for the procurement fraud I had described. And it was the Minister of Agriculture. So I wrote a paper on terms of how to reform agriculture and increase food security. And it turned out that I explained to him in a paper what he had been doing for years. <laughs> well, he's, by the way, he's a likely presidential candidate for the opposition party now. So it doesn't really matter in Malawi if you're tainted by these things. Um, but that I mean is it's that an institution. So I can find a couple of the things that I say, look, we need to find a way of unraveling. I'm not giving you a satisfactory answer here, but I think it's probably where it needs to be because you know, there is none of this. This is the kind of problem. We may know the end point, but that doesn't mean that the indicator tells us how to get to that end point and what the sequencing is. And that's where it becomes a bit more judgment. And that's where a bit comes back to it on the learning and the kind of accountability. It's also for the outsiders, needs to be pretty willing to learn and open-minded about what to do it. And I say, look, just as we hope elites would gamble and course correct, we should gamble if there's signs and being quite liberal on it, but not do the knee jerks. You know, I hated that in the, in the UK government, like, oh, they're doing something wrong, cut all the things. But then think carefully when you start cutting something. Can I give you an example that I really feel passionate about? And I was telling actually the, um, I shouldn't say who, someone high in the, in the administration, because it was confidential conversation, and who was defending it at all costs that was the right thing to do. This is Ethiopia conflict, okay? Conflict breaks out in the early stages. The first measure that's taken, one of the early measures, is kicking them out of Agoa, out of the trade deal. Now, we know even with Russia that we do targeted sanctions. We, know we haven't stopped trading with Russia. We do targeted sanctions. That's what the evidence is. But for an African country, we kick them out of the trade preference. Now, just think of it. If there's one class of people who needs to have good relations with the world, is the exporters. <laughs> you just undermine the entire political class that was aligned with that. And basically, they were marginalized as a result in the country because they suddenly couldn't quite claim, you know, look, we have this something, you know, they were punished on this. And 
Now the, the, the other more political, the, not, not the economic interest of people, the political interest of people say, yeah, you see, you, 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 you don't sell us, you don't give us anything, and so on and so on. And that gives me also an indicator of indicators I would have. I would like to measure in, uh, in some countries the percentage of domestic capital that gets invested in tradables. I would find that a useful indicator. I can't find any basic data on any of that. And actually, that would be kind of the useful things, you know? Who is trying to be looking outward? Who's trying to speak with the world? And it's not about the FDI coming in in a, in a protected zone. That's also in the interest of the elite. It's actually the domestic capital that says there. And that's the kind of thing. That's why I tell my the Nigerian friends, I want you to invest not just in non-tradables and show me that you're committed and try to gamble on the progress. Because if you all start doing this, the political lobby will emerge that actually wants these things to be more sensibly done. Okay. Long answer, please. Some more questions. Yes, there. Hi there. Thank you very much. Um, this may be slightly out, out of scope geographically. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's fine. Um, but the, the political economic rift between tradables and non-tradables as sectors that drive political outcomes um, is also important in part of the developed world. Yeah. I'm thinking of Southern Europe, for example. Uh, I'm from Greece, where this has been a hugely important issue. And we're talking about kind of development 2.0 or kind of halfway there uh, forever. Um, similar with Spain and Italy. So the kind of export services-oriented economies, how they can uh, boost actual exports, <laughs> and how can those economies do that within the confines of broader institutional kind of constraints, right? Like the yeah. Eurozone, et cetera. Thank okay. you. I'll take that in a, in a moment. Any, yeah, this one here or there as well. Excellent. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. So I actually, I think this is either a clarifying question or a real question, depends <laughs> on whether I understood well what you were trying to forward. Um, so basically what you said about the definition of an elite is just, you know, like not just the politicians, the business people, civil society, blah, blah. And the elite bargain then has to include not just the politicians, but also the business elite. Um, and I think that's something that, um, you know, at least is interesting is what do you do when the, um, the incentives are at odds with each other? So the business elite might have one incentive and the politicians might have one incentive i think yeah. for instance in latin america there's you know much more incentive for politicians to course correct than for business elites because businesses are not competitive um or, or many industries are not competitive so either a clarifying question or in that case no, no it's an excellent question very good question and one more in front and then we'll and i will do later the next round then yeah so um, thank you, Professor, for coming to talk to us today. So my question is just kind of like, I know like in the examples that you gave in terms of like which countries, you know, pursued like a development bargain, you saw there's, you saw like a lot of kinds of regime types, you know, like semi-democracies, full democracies, even some autocracies in this case. So I guess like, I guess like, you know, like do these regime type ma types matter? And if so, you know, like which regime type would actually be a lot better for a development bargain? You know, which one would be more likely for it to emerge? Like where a democracy where the elites constantly change or a, an autocracy where it's always constant for a very long time? Thank you. No let, let me start with the, with the last one that you said there. It's like, look, it's clearly because you already pointed out, you know, each of them has its advantages, disadvantages. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you could have the Winston Churchill quote, you know, it's like democracy may be the terrible system, but all the others are worse, you know, the kind of, kind of thing. I, and it's all about, and, and this is descriptive, not normative. You know, I like my democracy, by the way. I like my democracy. Um, but... It's, 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 so it's descriptive in terms of saying, can you organize the accountability in a way that it doesn't stop everything, but actually that it keeps on going? So, you know, that means in democracies, you'll need probably different types of politicians that actually can keep it going. And I'll come back to the Spain and the kind of stories done in a moment because it's linked to that. And uh, while maybe in autocracy, it's maybe another type, you know, it's like a very managerial CEO type, you may probably need an autocracy because otherwise the incentives can't be, can't be set. So, so you know, you, you have it. And so it becomes a bit like, and again, I'm talking about takeoff, you know. I have no dispute here with, say, the Asimov Robinson that's saying at some point, you know, the openness becomes matter, comes to matter for just the new ideas and the adoption of new ideas. So you kind of probably reach a moment where this becomes important. And of course, 
that's then when we sometimes see now it actually narrows rather than broadens. Uh, and that's then another, and, and that's probably another book for another for a much more versed political scientist that knows about these kind of countries to actually do this. So, but but so yeah. So I give the very unsatisfactory answer. It depends, but that actually there's enough configurations that seem to have worked. That's another part of it. So it's so it's it depends, but there's also enough configuration. So it's not as if there's not enough to learn from alternatives and trying to do something that that works. And the last thing I want to give is a, as an encouragement to say an autocrat who doesn't do anything and saying, well, you know, it's fine, you know, you're doing as good as, as them, you, you want to do it. So there, there is at least something with democracy, that there is at least an inbuilt opportunity that we may have another person once in a while that God knows may do it a bit better. And uh, so there is an element there. But, but in takeoff, actually the evidence, so the mean performance on growth in the early stages of development is the same. Interestingly, the spread in economic performance is narrower with democracies than in autocracies. And you can see what I'm trying to say. You get some really good performance in autocracies, some really bad performance in, the, in, in, in autocracy as well. And that's, the, that's what you probably, if you, if you worry about the spread, then, then you have your answer already on what works better. Um, the just, yeah, the, the, the question of terms of the kind of elites and business elite and so on. What I would probably say, especially the way you framed and they said Latin America, is that actually in the end the business elite controls these countries. And that you could have a political leader that sometimes emerges that maybe get with popular vote is doing it, but you actually the structures are like they are. So the structures are. So the, the elite bargain is the business elite bargain. And actually the other thing is the show because it actually they don't really have the power to do anything. And so occasionally you may get a successful politician that can forge that bargain between the different groups and that's actually somehow and it what i find really interesting so so i i should say it's something i was struck by thinking of latin american countries i seem to have more book reviews in spanish now even though not a single spanish-speaking country is covered because there's something recognizable about the lack of a kind of an elite bargain to growth and development but i would then simply say there's a fragmentation of that elite bargain and it just somehow becomes so vest, so so strong vested interest that actually they can't quite get get there. The inequalities are so high that actually there is no obvious forging of these 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 bargains there, and it probably alludes to something that I worry about and I kind of want to learn more about is that you know how comes that some middle income countries, few of them, managed in recent decades to go further, and of course then people talk about middle income trap. So I'm uh, so in fact one of the countries I'm going to spend some time in in in. in uh, in coming, in coming months. In fact, in October, I spent a month in Mauritius. I'm also taking a holiday, okay, admit to it. But uh, I'll do some public events as well, and talking about, in fact, and the title I was given is, you know, how is Mauritius, uh, uh, how, how has it kept on renewing its elite bargain, but how can it do it in the future? And actually to keep the growth going. And somehow, it's exactly that the question comes from them as well, and I think that's the kind of thing that you ask yourself. So it leads to the Southern European thing, it has a similarity to it. Um, I was really struck at UNICEF, there was a Spanish representative in that meeting, and initially, you know, as it would be at UN meetings, they were all very hostile about it, and they were all talking, you know, but need a need a loan, a humanitarian thing. And then slowly people actually realized to start reflecting on countries they knew, and so they talked about Myanmar, we talked about, we talked about elite bargains in Cambodia that we tend to condemn, but actually it's quite developmental, even though we don't like a lot of other things, and so on. And she spoke about, about Spain. Spain. And she basically said the early stages of when democracy came in Spain, that actually it was partly an elite bargain also between the business and the unions, and a very clear process happened. Just as we know in South Africa, there were clear processes that I had. I had the pleasure, in fact, after Brian, we were last speaking, I had an evening with Trevor Manuel, who lyrically was trying to the finance minister in South Africa at the time of, in the, of um, after apartheid. Lyrically was talking about the structural forms they took, and we should talk more because, of course, they all embedded them in formal structures and not in informal structures, which is actually Brian's point and he illustrated it carefully, and in Spain a bit as well. So they embedded this all in very formal structures, but that actually gives give you that much flexibility to move it on because it's formally struck. Yeah? So the deals are made at the early stages, but actually there's, a, there's not enough space for reimagining uh, re the agreements and the deals 
between the different groups, so that when new elites emerge, there's not an easy space at the table for them. That's what I'm trying to say. So you reach this, and that's maybe the kind of problem with middle income or with, with upper, middle in, upper middle income, sorry, upper middle income and maybe some lower high income countries, that somehow or another they can't find the mechanism to renew these kind of things. I'm less pessimistic about Spain than about Greece, but maybe uh, because I do sense, because I, you also say, oh, tradables, not tradables. So it's not about t-shirts and garments, by the way, it's not manufacturing. You know, one thing people forget that non-tradables used to be haircuts. Uh, actually, there's still haircuts and there's so many other non-tradables. And with technology, with internet and so on, there's countries that export. India makes more money from internet-enabled services that it exports than from anything manufactured. So actually, it's not a, not a failure of the model, so you can make them tradable. But the point is, again, try to make them tradable and not just services that are purely internal. Anyway, so, so one more yeah. round, is that all right? Okay, so I'm I'll gonna, go, let me then... Um, I'm gonna take a question first. Yeah, I'll, yeah, and then you, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I had a question of if you could speak a little bit about the relationship between climate change and the development bargain. Yeah, excellent. Um, Especially as you know, in a few weeks, people will all be going to—not we, but the nations will be going to COP27. A lot of discussions on climate finance in terms of channeling money to these developing countries who are dealing with it, and if that's an opportunity to uh, incentivize development bargains, especially countries where the elites are suspend are deeply intertwined with the fossil fuel industry, how that will work, and just generally your thoughts on it. Excellent. Let's then go back and then I'll come forward. And I'll take, let me take all the questions, and then it's the last round we take. Yeah? Uh, thank you very much. And then you as well, eh? yeah. Uh, in 2015, uh, 193 UN member states uh, committed to achieve the uh, so-called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, in my opinion, that there are two factors. Uh, the ability to achieve the SDGs would depend on uh, first, good governance, and second, international support. And, and my question is about uh, former Soviet countries, in specifically those in Central Asian South Caucasus. Uh, do you think they, they have potential to achieve uh, the SDGs by 2030? And the second question, how would you assess their potential in terms of uh, towards good governance, uh, potential of former Soviet republics in Central Asian South Caucasus? towards good governance. Thank Good. you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, my question surrounds uh, the role of implementers. Specifically, I work for a USAID MCC implementer. So what role could implementers play when they're maybe beholden to USAID priorities or MCC priorities or state priorities? Um, I guess as it pertains to working with government counterparts, what strategies um, and implementation would you suggest or recommend? I know that can be kind of open-ended, open but I'd be interested Sexy. to hear. I've been there. I've <laughs> been there, done it, <laughs> and suffered. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Akhtar Mahmoud. I, with Brian, I was at the World Bank for almost three decades. And I also come from one of the countries that Stefan covers in the book, Bangladesh. So I have a comment and, uh, and a question. But first, a little thing about democracy. It reminded me of Idi Amin's famous statement, I can guarantee you freedom of speech, but not freedom after speech. <laughs> uh, now, on Bangladesh, I've been um, exploring uh, the reasons for Bangladesh's economic transformation since independence. And the last few weeks, I've been spending some time looking at the various economic debates that have gone on in the last 50 years, particularly the work of economists on various topics. And they debated various topics from nationalization to agricultural input policy to exchange rate regimes and all that. And I'm mapping that against the positions and the analysis done by the World Bank and other donors, because they were very important players in Bangladesh. And what I'm discovering is that there was a very interesting set of dynamics between the donors on the one hand, the local experts, including economists, and the government. And my tentative hypothesis is, is the fact that both these parties outside government, which is the local experts and the donors, were very active in coming up with ideas, coming up with positions and debates. The fact that not one party was dominant, I think was a very good thing. Because you mentioned somewhere in your book that the age relationship in Bangladesh has been reasonably good, despite many frictions and things. It has been quite productive. 
And I think it's not just the fact that the World Bank and the uh, 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 donors and the government had a productive relation. There was also the intermediating role of a vibrant group of experts in the country. And I think that's very important, including for the donors to understand that to have such a vibrant group of people who may not always agree with you uh, is actually good at the end of the day. And the last one is a question, again, related to Bangladesh. Recently, I, I drew up a list of the 12 most important economic managers in the country, other than the prime minister. So about half a dozen ministers, the governor of the central bank, the secretary of the finance ministry, and the prime minister has three advisors who work on uh, economic issues. I think with the possible exception of one, none of them are seasoned politicians. They're either bureaucrats or what I call nouveau politicians who had been in other professions and joined politics recently. Do you think that imbalance is a problem? <laughs> Fine. Just a quick question. So you tell us what to do where there is a development bargain. You tell us what to do where there isn't a development bargain. I'm interested in the shades of gray, and I'll make it very specific. Let's think of our shade of gray country just for, as Kenya. In a country like that, should donors provide support for basic education? Should donors provide support for urban and rural water? <laughs> okay. You can see why I picked those sectors. That's those a question. Um, okay. So sorry that I quickly take the notes. And so let let me try to. Um, I'll take. I'll, I think I'll take them all, and I'll. I'll I think I'll finish with Akta's one, um, as the last one. So, so the. So, so the f first thing was on, on climate and development bargaining. So, you know, I, I talk relatively little about climate. There's a bit I talk about in the book, um, you know, including how unjust I find net zero per country. I, I would prefer negative consumption in uh, rich economies and um, leaving space for some of the low-income countries that have probably about what is it, one two hundredth of the capitalization, capital, capital per capita that the US has. Uh, you know, need some space for capital accumulation uh, in these places. So anyway, but I'm also, your question is also about what to do, and of course it's all the finance. So I am terrified about what's happening on the, on the climate finance stuff, where we suddenly behave as if anything we've ever learned, suddenly it doesn't matter anymore. And we're now just going to, again, just throw at money at problems. We see a country with a problem, we'll assume that, there, that it will actually the right place to get the highest returns, even the highest returns for mitigation or for adaptation. And the, this, the dichotomy that I try to draw, and maybe even the, what's the word again? Trichotomy, yeah, what is the word? Trichotomy, isn't it? So the three ways, there's a bit of a middle group and the first one and second. So I want to actually be quite liberal and there's a group where it's okay, where the development bargain is there. You know, why don't we make much more these places the vanguard on the developing world that actually end up doing it? You know, yes, the, the, because what's the point of spending that money in a place where nothing will be done with it and nothing good will be done? It won't help you with adaptation or mitigation. So, for example, you know, we all. Clearly, we need to find ways of protecting the Congo Basin. We need to way find ways of, of the Amazon forest. But think a bit careful. The Amazon is many countries. Do we really want to suddenly do something we would not have done for a long time to give basically budget support to the DRC government and budget support to Bolsonaro? Well, actually, carbon credits are a form of budget support. You basically give them, and Bolsonaro tells us he'll spend it all via the military. And you say, oh, that's suddenly fine, you know, if you spent all the budget support via the military. So, you know, just take the same lens. The development bargain and some, you need, that's the kind of set of incentives that are more likely to want to invest in the adaptation and being future-proof, because the development bargain, maybe one feature of it is that it's actually future-oriented and not distributive. So you want to actually be willing to be selective. So that's something about that nothing in the whole setup we're doing uh, that we at the moment doing. Okay, so and then there's all kinds of, of course, the equi equity and justice points there as well. But just, you no, know, I really worry about it. And I see the nature of the experts that are pushing it. We go back to people who don't know about implementation. We go back all to be kind of uh, on the green space. There's nothing wrong with it, but passionate about the topic rather than I can make get something done. And so you have a real issue there. And, 
Well, I, I really worry about this. Um, then, the, then the places like what you said there on the former Soviet Union, you know, one of the countries I'm going to spend some time in the next six months, so I'm basically going to travel for six months. I'm going to go to Uzbekistan because Uzbekistan is actually one of these places where amongst them you see something trying to happen with the new, the new president. He's clearly quite committed. It's interesting that he's mentioned the SDGs because he uses it to his advantage. He uses it as his, as his narrative. I'm going to deliver the SDGs as a contrast to what people have done. Okay, so use it locally, sensibly, and so on. And they tried to think. In fact, I met the finance minister, at least the deputy finance minister, and the question he had, you know, how do I get good governance between local and central authority and ministry of finance? You know, all the things that that, that kind of doing it. But I find it already admirable that amongst them, there are at least some where they're actually trying to do something. Because as you probably know, there's plenty of them that don't try to do, try to do anything in Central Asia and make it worse. And so it's the answer from the earlier thing, you know, focus on finding a couple of these Central Asian places. Maybe it's Uzbekistan is worth gambling on to actually say, let's actually try to get it there. We know the World Bank actually, fortunately, there was the World Bank who got in touch when the book came out and the senior economist wrote to me and said, hey, by the way, you should have had a chapter on my book. And then actually the UN resident representative, unrelated, did the same thing. And I thought, okay, there's clearly, they're spotting something, maybe not be true and so on, and I feel like worth doing. So selectively finding it, getting the examples. But, but all these former, it's not just Central, Central Asia, you know, Ukraine, when we're going to get back to it, you know, uh, I, I usually have this little game, what was the second most corrupt country according to Transparency International in 2019 after Russia? It's Ukraine, it's not Belarus, it's called to Transparency International. Procurement fraud is terrible, infrastructure is the most corrupt industry. Oh, we're going to do a massive reconstruction program. So we have this real risk there that the international support is going to make everything worse and actually create not everything worse, something will be better if we can reconstruct, of course, but actually embed structures that actually create further problems for the future, or we can do, do better as well. So yeah, so there's, there's things. So USA did MCC. So you know, the one thing that at least as the implementer you can do is to do your best. And I think do your best in this context is actually be subversive. You know, you know I, 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 I kind of think a bit about a good implementer Especially in countries where it's a mess. Yeah, in countries where it's kind of aligned, yes, of course, not everybody's done perfect to work with, but in principle, we should be supportive of these countries and do it. Of course, you work a lot in countries where it's not. And then actually you say, well, you are a, sub a, so a subversive fo force. And why I'm saying that is that at some point, someone accused me with some of the things in my book is that I, were, that I was a bit like the CIA. But actually, funnily enough, I kind of like to think of it because we... And it's lots of judgment, and please, you jump up and you can criticize. But, you know, broadly speaking, I think, you know, you probably on the ground as an implementer, you would want to get development and growth. Your bosses clearly want somehow, I don't know, condemning China or whatever they want to do today. And the country itself wants to maybe, you know, get richer themselves, the, or the, the people you deal with. So you are in a situation where you control a little bit, but not that much. So that's why I'm saying, slightly subversive, you know, how do I design the program in such a way that I nudge it a bit, that actually, given my task in hand, that I keep on thinking, you know, is there a chance that if I pick a slightly different collaborator, they may be slightly better connected with something else that actually is a force for good. A slightly different company that I work with locally as the implementer, a group of people that has actually maybe ambition of later on do certain things, you strengthen them and so on. So you strengthen the individuals, the players, the partners you work with, partly as a way of, of, of shifting the incentives in the elite bargain. Of course, your leeway is not so much, but you keep that in mind. You kind of, you know, as, as sometimes people in, in different used to say, you know, you, you, you think politically while you implement, you know, you think and you think through the politics too as well. Anyway, um, then, uh, yeah, no, very, very nice point, uh, Akta, that, that you make. And what I, what I think also, you know, we can have that in some countries where sometimes these local experts can be very influential and very, very powerful language. Now, I would say in Nigeria, I get that as well. But then they do it all in ideology, ideological terms. The nice thing about the Bangladeshi experts that, that they had, for some reason or another, they became quite pragmatic. And it probably may have still to do with the history was a little bit that I, neither were they necessarily old vested interests. 
uh, because the change had so profound in society, but maybe also that they were actually quite relatively pragmatic, although I did get the question at one of my events in Bangladesh what the role of the vanguard was in, uh, in, uh, in my book, <laughs> which I thought was interesting, of course, the Marxist framework. So it, it, and it works a bit like that. You know, there's the work that, that people do where they write about technopoles, basically people, technocrats that are politically savvy or politicians that have certain technical side to it. It's a bit of these two things. Um, I was really struck when I was, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a source person to a network of chief economic advisors of government in African countries. So these are presidential advisors and prime ministerial advisors. And they divide in two. The Francophones are clearly more political and they translated a term in technopoliticien. They immediately thought themselves as politicians. While the Anglophones were very strikingly, they said, no, we are technocrat poles or technopoles. Oh, and they, they understood the word better. And so there's a bit like, I think the Bangladeshi were probably more Va valued the technical side to it and understood the politics rather than politicians who played a bit with technical things. And so that you need that kind of intermediaries and so on. No, I'm totally with you and they're worth investing, investing in. Um, and, then, and it's the same kind of people that, you know, the, the kind of 12 you have, these are what the local experts can talk to in your first part of your point. And then um, um, I was going to take that as the last question, but then I'll leave you, Brian, with, with the last question. So what do I do in Kenya, and do I invest in water and in education? Okay, so, so I find Kenya. Okay, let me take education, you know, because I'm an evidence-based person. I try to actually think about the evidence. It's actually kind of a nice example where, you know, uh, where we go the whole range of, you know, we want to make sure children start learning in Kenya. There's actually a window of opportunity, and in fact, there's a bit of evidence that actually some of the programs, even of government, were actually relatively successful and reasonably well e evaluated. And of course, we also have, now I can go to Western Kenya, endless research by the Nobel Prize winners on how to get education to work. Now, it actually illustrates nicely the sequence, the three things I would do. So the first thing that, the, that the what works people in a narrow sense would do, and you know, they're far more reasonable than I will describe them, and forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll stereotype them. They would say, look, I'll, I'll just do what works in an idealized situation. They work with an NGO and they get the children to learn. So there's a wonderful paper cited in the Nobel Prize for Michael Kramer that actually basically said teaching assistants help the, the children learning. It's one of the most effective interventions you could do in education. In, in, in general, they say, let me at least say in Kenya, getting teaching assistants who support the children during learning. Okay? Seems self-evident to see people say, is that, did you get a Nobel Prize for that? But anyway, he did it very carefully. Let me not try to diss that. Um, but basically, teaching assistance was one of the things that was one of the few interventions that actually changed. Textbooks didn't make any difference. Blackboards didn't do did flip charts. But teaching assistance worked. We'll talk more if you're so surprised. <laughs> um, but, but that's what I would do. And I'd say that's the perfect thing. Now, if you're just like, say, oh, I want to just do what works, you go around the world telling them to have teaching assistance in the schools. Now, actually, Justin Sandefur and Tessie Bolt, they went out to Kenya as well, and I, I have to claim I was a little bit behind it. I gave them the money internally in Oxford, and they went to do this, and they said, let's see where it, because the minister didn't understand any of this, let's try to do it in a state school, because he said, the minister said, look, that's NGOs, they're not relevant for my state schools. So they did the same experiment back in the state schools, okay? So, and in a way, what they find in the state schools and the control for the, the, the NGOs, they find it doesn't work in the state school. Okay, and now we're coming a bit closer to where Brian is pushing this. We know that actually the reason is probably political constraints. The trade unions did everything they could to marginalize these teaching assistants. And unlike in the NGO, the unions were powerful and they basically said, look, we need to marginalize this because otherwise our position is undermined. And so they went to the high court even to actually appeal to it that the, stu that the study couldn't even take place. You know, you go to the high court that the study cannot take place. You push it very hard. And clearly there was zero effect and they can't fully prove it. But it does seem to be very much the underlying political economy of teacher unions that actually are blocking it. Now you could say, well, that's, you know, then I need to find another intervention to do it. Now, and I think you could then say, look, the studies we should be doing is within the political reality, what is the best thing we can do? And so I think still, maybe we want to do learning, but do it with your eyes wide open and understand what you can achieve in learning. But I am not happy with that because I want to make that political constraint endogenous to the problem. I want to ask, finding the interventions 
that doesn't take the union power for granted, but actually can, but we know because that union power in that particular case is really detrimental to the educational system. I want to think, how do I do what you ask me to do to actually influencing that position as well? What would be the, the second best intervention given these constraints, but I treat if people understand the, the technicality of it, I treat the political strain to endogenous so that I get as good as possible, possibly changing a bit of political constraint as well, doing a right intervention. So I would do a program that take, takes into account not just as given these constraints, but tries to think about it. How do I shift the incentive?